This will make sense in about 10 minutes, but uh, I thought about uh, if you get a little hungry, raise your hand at the midway point in the message, and I'll, like Lambert, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if anybody wants. My hands are clean, I promise. I washed them before, so if, these are fresh if you want to eat them. When I do throw them, enjoy. But have you ever wondered if you have what it takes to get through what life is throwing at you? Not bread, but other things, you know, the things that you're dealing with. Whether you'll be able to get through what's standing right here today, waiting for you when you go home. Have you ever felt inadequate, insecure, not good enough, insufficient to do what's being asked of you? I think we all feel that way in our lives, no matter who we are, no matter what we believe. Feelings like that are normal. You know, I feel that way a lot in my life, even as a pastor, as a follower of Christ. Maybe you feel that way in your relationships today. You're wondering, you know, do I have what it takes to get through that? Or maybe as a parent or as a spouse, you're, you're really, you know, feeling like you don't know what to do next. You don't know if you have what it takes. Maybe you feel that way at work tomorrow, right? When it comes to your education or the future career that you'll have one day. Can I really do it? Am I good enough? Am I enough to take that step forward? Maybe you even feel that way with God. Maybe somebody... Or something caused you to feel that way, like you weren't good enough, like Nick said, to do good and be good with God. Like you couldn't do maybe what God is even asking you to do right now in your life. Maybe that's the reason why you walked away from faith. Or maybe, you know, the reason why you know somebody who walked away from faith. Because, you know, we just don't feel like we have what it takes to do what we're being asked to do. Regardless of whether we're, you know, someone who believes in in Jesus or not, we can all wonder if we have what it takes. And I remember feeling that way years ago when I sensed God leading me to become a pastor and leave the pathway that I had been on to become an attorney. You know, I'll never forget hearing God whisper words to me that still to this day have been both inspirational and terrifying, that that made me feel insufficient and inadequate. You know, when I heard God say, Jason, I've created you for so much more than this. Those words touched something deep inside of me, and they stirred something that I didn't even know was there. And the challenge was that the more God had in store for me was bigger than me. It meant that I had to do something I didn't think I could do, and on my own, I didn't know if I had what it took. I was scared. I was inadequate. I didn't know if I had what it takes to do it. I think we all feel that way. We have fears. We have insecurities. We know, we know ourselves. I think we feel that way because we know our limitations. We know our weaknesses, right? Come on, nobody needs to remind us of all those things we wonder and worry about. And as a result of knowing ourselves, we can easily doubt ourselves. Do I really have what it takes? Can I really get through what life is throwing at me, what's standing in front of me? That's what I want to talk with you about today because if you've ever felt that way, you're not alone. Not just myself included, but there. That describes every person that God has ever used throughout the history of the scriptures. People who didn't think that they had what it took to do what God was asking them to do, to do what life was throwing at them, requiring them to do. Whether it was Moses or the great King David or even Jesus' own disciples, nobody thought that they could do what God wanted them to do. Nobody felt they had what it took to get through what was standing in front of them. Nobody felt capable. Nobody felt like they were good enough. All of them felt this way and said the same thing. What and who am I to do what God is asking me to do? Who am I? Are you sure you've got the right person? I don't think I can do that. And just like them, we can wonder in our lives when it comes to our relationships, when it comes to as a parent maybe, when it comes to so many different things, who am I to do anything about this? When we look at the state of our world, come on somebody, we see the problems and the division, we think, what can I do? Who am I to make a difference? Are you sure you've got the right person here? I can't do a thing about what's in front of me, this mountain that's in front of me. Can I really do it? What we're going to discover today is that no matter who we are, no matter what we believe about God, is, this is the reality, that God can help anyone, anywhere, who's willing to trust in Him and hope in Him. There can be real help for your life if you are willing to put your hope and trust in Him. Not the kind of you know, arbitrary, ethereal, maybe God can help my life. I'm talking about practical, real help to take a next step forward, beyond and through whatever is standing in front of you. Hoping in Him, trusting in Him, provides the help that we all need 
to get through whatever is standing in front of us right now. And I want to walk you through a story from the Old Testament Jewish scriptures uh, about a man named Gideon. If you've ever heard of him or know of some of his story, Gideon was what's called a judge in the ancient nation of Israel about 1,200 years before the birth of Jesus. But he wasn't a judge in the kind of sense that we might think of today. A judge, you know, in those days was simply just a man or a woman, and there were women, uh, it was just a person that God used to lead his people and inspire his people and mobilize and deliver his people and bring them freedom and safety from those who were trying to be, you know, who were enemies. A hero, a warrior in some sense. But that's not how Gideon's story begins. When we meet Gideon, he's struggling to know what to do with what life is throwing at him with what life is throwing at his people. He's struggling to believe that he's somebody who can actually do something about what needs to be done. When we meet Gideon, he's being asked by God to do something that seems impossible, something that seems way bigger than him, and he's insufficient and inadequate to do the task. And if we were in Gideon's shoes, we would probably feel the same way. His people were being oppressed by a group called the Midianites. They were brutal. They were vengeful. They were horrible people committed to reducing Israel to a wasteland. They hated Israel. Just to give you a little context, when Israel would plant their crops and, 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 and farm and harvest their crops, and the crops would be gathered, the Midianites would come in like locusts, uh, swarming those crops, not only taking all the crops for themselves that they didn't have to work for, but then they would murder anybody who would try to stop them. And sometimes they would murder them just to demonstrate how much more power and control they had over Israel. And Israel lacked the strength and the faith and the leadership to actually do anything about it effectively. So Gideon's people were living helpless as victims with no hope. And they would flee to the caves. And they would hide in the hills. They were defenseless and powerless. And, and they had a stronger enemy dominating them. Life got really complicated and really hard. You ever been there? You don't know what to do. And you feel helpless. You want things to get better, and you want things to change, but you're not sure how to do that. You're not sure what to do to get that. And even if you did know, you're not sure if you are the kind of person who's able to do it. You're not sure you have what it takes to get through what life is throwing at you. That's where Gideon was. That's where a lot of people in Gideon's day were. But it was their own fault in a lot of ways because in the Old Testament book of Judges, this Jewish book of Judges, Israel would repeatedly think they didn't need God. And so they would walk away from God, walk away from serving Him, walk away from obeying Him, and they would, as a result, suffer the consequences of that, which was usually in the form of surrounding nations coming in and taking over and controlling and dominating them. But whenever Israel realized they needed God after walking away from God, when they would realize that they needed God again, they would cry out to God for help, and God would send them a judge, a leader, to deliver them, a warrior that he could use to help things change and get better. And in this moment, that's who God had in mind. God had Gideon in mind. But there's just one problem with that. Gideon doesn't think he can do it, and he's not up to the task. So God sends an angel to give Gideon a little confidence. And the irony here is that when the angel appears, this great warrior, the Lord is calling. Go ahead and answer that. It's all right. <laughs> this great warrior is hiding. Now, this is what the scriptures tell us, right? The angel of the Lord appeared to, uh, came and sat beneath the great tree at Oprah, not that Oprah, the other Oprah, okay? And the angel of the Lord came and he sat beneath this tree and he was waiting for Gideon, who was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Remember, I said they would come and they would take it all for themselves. So in a lot of ways, though, it's more than just telling us what Gideon was doing. It's telling us why Gideon was doing it. It's kind of biblical sarcasm. The author's helping Gideon not look quite like a coward here, okay? It's the, it's the Bible's way of saying, while others hid in caves and ran to the hills, Gideon hid in a wine press. He was at the bottom of the wine press. Nobody could find him or see him. He was threshing wheat, hiding out, making sure that the enemy couldn't find him. And so the angel of the Lord appeared to him and he said, listen to the words, mighty warrior, cowering in his, in his grain, right? The Lord is with you. God wanted a warrior. God said that warrior was Gideon, but Gideon doesn't agree. And not only does he not agree, but he, we also learn that Gideon had lost faith in God because of what had been happening to them. This is, this is what he said, sir, 
getting replied to the angel. If the Lord is with us, maybe you've said something like this to God in response to what's going on in your life. If, if God is really for me, then why is this happening to me? Anybody ever say that before? Where, I mean, where are all the miracles we were told about? Our ancestors said, you know, hey, didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt, which had only happened less than a couple hundred years before Gideon's day. Moses and the, and the Red Sea coming out of Israel, that was still fresh and new in the history of Israel. Those events had just happened. Didn't, haven't we been told about this great God who was with us and for us? This promised land, all the optimism of the promised land was gone by this point because of what was happening in their life. Their faith was low. And let me just say this. If you're here or you're watching online and maybe you're not sure what you believe, maybe you used to believe and you walked away from believing, but if you've ever struggled to believe in God or hold on to faith in Him because of what you were going through and how it felt, you're not the only one. In fact, I would say that most, if not all of us, if we're honest, would say that there have been moments in our life where we wondered, God, if you're good and if you love me, why am I going through this? You feel hopeless. You feel overwhelmed. Where are you? To Gideon, it felt like God had abandoned them, and he had handed his people over to the enemy. The angel of the Lord then said to Gideon, go with the strength that you have, which Gideon didn't have much, and I want you to rescue Israel. I'm sending you. Which in that moment, if you're Gideon, if we're Gideon, let's put ourselves in his shoes. I'm thinking, um, wait just one second. I'm sorry, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to do it with? with? I'm sorry, with what strength should I do it with? How can I rescue Israel? How can I do what you're asking me to do? How can I move forward through what's in front of me? I don't think I can do it. Not only do I not think I can do it, but my family is literally the weakest in all of the 12 tribes of Israel. He came from the tribe of Manasseh, one of those 12 tribes of Israel. And I'm the least, my family's the weakest, and I'm the least in my weakest family. I am a nobody. Who am I to do anything? I'm the black sheep, right? Come on, Chris Farley fans out there. I'm the black sheep of my family. I can't do it. What's in front of me is too big. It's too hard. It's too scary. You need somebody better than me. And the Lord told him, I will be with you. Those are important words, friends. And you will do what I'm saying you can do. You will do. You will destroy them. As if you were just fighting against one man. But by his own admission, Gideon doesn't think that he can do it. Life was too big. What was happening was too hard. God, what he was asking was too great. He's the least and the weakest. What can he do about what's in front of him? He just didn't see what God saw. He didn't see what God saw in him. Thankfully, aren't you glad God sees differently than you and I see? When it comes to me and you, he sees something that we don't see in ourselves. God believes in Gideon a lot more than Gideon even believes in God. And I think it's important that somebody here today, or maybe you're watching online, understands that God doesn't think about you the way you think about you. God doesn't see you the way you see yourself, through the lens of maybe your failures, through the lens of your weaknesses and fears. God doesn't think that way about you. He sees you through eyes of faith. Even if you're here and you're not a follower, not a believer, listen, you are not what you feel. You are not what others say about you. You are not your weaknesses, failures, insecurities, or your hurts. You are who your God says you are. And the way God sees you is greater than anything you see in yourself. He looks at all of us through eyes of faith and potential and who we can become with his help, not ours. He sees what's possible. We only see what's impossible. But here, with, with God's help, Gideon is told he will defeat, but he doubts. He doubts what God saw in him, and he asked God to give him a sign, as if the angel wasn't a sign enough, right? I mean, come on, somebody, if somebody, if an angel shows up to your job tomorrow, helping you with what you need to do next today or tomorrow, that's a sign, friends. Like, that just doesn't happen, but Gideon still doubts, and so he asks for another sign. So if you know the story, I'll, I'll hit this part quickly, but this is where his famous fleece comes in. He puts out his fleece, and he wants God to show him a sign twice Gideon asks God, he puts this fleece out, uh, out of his tent, and he asks God to show him, if it is your will for me too, then I want you to, and then the next morning he wakes up, God has done it. Well, he doesn't believe yet right away, so he asks him a second time the next day, if you really want me to, then do the opposite of what you did, and God does it twice. Don't you wish God would answer our questions like that today? 
Don't you, wouldn't it be awesome, right? Come on, we're stick sad. Wouldn't it be awesome? Okay, God, if the Royals win today, I'll know that you want me to, or come on, parents, God, if you want me to do this instead of that, then make sure my kids don't fight at all today. I will know that is a sign from God. It's really you, Lord. <laughs> and God answered Gideon's doubts and his fears not once, not twice, a total of three times. It's enough for Gideon to move forward. And when Gideon's army, he rallies an army. When his army really kind of arrives, 32,000 men are just as fed up and tired of what the Midianites have done. And if you're Gideon, come on. 30, anybody in, in, been in the military before? 32,000 soldiers. That's not a bad day. Gideon's feeling pretty good about himself. I like my chances. Maybe we can do something about this. Maybe God can use someone like me. Maybe what's in front of me isn't bigger than what we can do about it. Maybe this will work. I mean, look at all these guys, right? But then God shows up and speaks a second time. It's not something Gideon would want to hear. And if we were in his shoes, we wouldn't want to hear it either. I imagine the conversation going something like this. God's saying, hey, Gideon, great job on recruiting an army. Look at all these guys. Stellar job. Well done, well done, well done, well done. Thanks, God. I really appreciate it. I worked really hard. I like our chances for sure. I'm feeling really good about it. And then there's this awkward pause. Yeah, just, just, just one problem, the Lord said to Gideon. Uh, you got too many men. Uh, is that a thing? Like, is that even a thing? Can we, can we have, Trent, too many men in battle? Come on, can we have too many? Is that even a thing? I mean, you're kidding me, right? This is a joke. Too many warriors. Ha, good one, God. God's not kidding, though. This is, this is the lesson. If I, if I let you fight with all those men, then the men, the Israelites, will boast that it was by their own strength that they saved themselves, not by mine. Well, what would be so bad about that, God? <laughs> I'm okay with that. At least we'd still be alive. Tell the people, whoever is timid, whoever's afraid, you can leave and you can go home. And God is saying, when you're victorious, not if, but when, and you will be victorious, but when you're victorious, the glory will be mine. I will share it with no one. You won't get the credit. They won't get the credit. They won't take it for themselves. You will give it to me because you will know that it was me and not you. So we're told that 22,000 of them went home. 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 willing to fight. <sighs> okay, maybe there's still a way. But the Lord told Gideon a second time, there are still too many men. You've got to be feeling sick if you're Gideon at this point, right? You've got to be like, okay, really, God, you're getting a little annoying now. And he gives Gideon some specific instructions to take the remaining men down to this stream. And whoever drinks the water by cupping it with their hands, instead of who <laughs> plunge their heads into the water like animals, ah, 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 you know, trying to get the water because they're so thirsty, the ones who grab it with their hands are the ones who are to take into battle. And out of the 10,000 men, we're told that only 300 of the men drank from their hands. Which tells you something about the Israelite army, right? I mean, this was just not your, this was a motley crew uh, at best of men who are thirsty and who just dunk their whole head into the, into the stream. Uh, it's like my dog, Remy, who's just a puppy. He just, his tongue flailing all over the place trying to get water, dripping all over the place. This, this, all those guys had to go home. And if I'm Gideon, I know what I'm thinking. There's no way this is going to work. We do not have enough guys to do this. We don't have what it takes. Here we are again, feeling the same insecurities, feeling the same fears and, insecure, and pain and wondering what, what, what's going to happen. And on his own, he's right. He's not going to be able to do anything with 300 guys. But thankfully, God would be the one helping him. And God would be the one who was the difference maker. So the Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, you will, oh, go back one, go back one. You will rescue and give victory over the Midianites. I will, I will defeat them with these 300. And Gideon, as he's watching his army go home, as he stands there with his 300 men, anxious and uncertain, hoping and trusting that God will do exactly what God has said, it's literally the night before the battle. And he's got his 300 guys, and he can hear in the distance the army of the Midianites. And even though it's the nighttime, 
It sounds like there are tens of thousands of enemy soldiers, and he's right, there are. It's not just Midian, it's an alliance of nations. And if you didn't doubt God before, he's definitely doubting God right now. If you didn't have insecurity before, he definitely has insecurity now. Like a flood, all the old feelings came back. And maybe he's like us. Maybe he'd be tempted to run. Maybe he's tempted to just to give up without a fight and, and surrender. But he does something else, something very interesting. We're told that he takes a soldier, only one other soldier, and the two of them go and spy on the enemy's camp in the middle of the night. For some reason, he wants to hear what they're saying. He needs to see for himself. So together, under the cover of night, they go like ninjas, creeping and crawling until they're you know, right next to the, these two soldiers, the exact place where these two soldiers who were awake, keeping watch over the night, over, this, over the camp, were having a conversation. And these two soldiers, unaware of the presence of Gideon and his friend, have a conversation, and Gideon can't believe what he hears. One soldier told the other about a dream that he had had. It sounds like it was in the middle of the night who had been woken up for his watch. And he said, this is the dream that I had. I had this dream, and in my dream, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down the Midianite camp. And this loaf of bread hit our tents with such force that it knocked it all over and it destroyed everything in the camp. A loaf of bread. It's a strange dream, right? If you were me and I were in that conversation, I'd say, what did you have for dinner last night? I mean, that might be really the tell. Was it pizza? Was it something spicy? But his friend told him, who heard the dream, interestingly enough, your dream can only mean one thing. God has given Gideon, son of Joash, that Israelite victory over Midian and all of its allies. Think about this for just a second. By some miracle, by God's divine providence, Gideon shows up at the perfect place at the perfect time to hear the perfect words he needed to hear in the moment to give him the confidence and the courage and faith to trust that God was going to do exactly what God said he would do. God would use Gideon to get through what life was throwing at them. And as he heard the conversation, Gideon must have just been amazed to hear coming out of the mouth of his enemy how victory was already assured. God had orchestrated everything so perfectly. But there's something about the dream that I think is important to, just to hone in and focus on, which makes the bread that I'm holding in my hand a little bit more make sense for you. Why bread? Why barley bread? The Midianite, remember, saw in his dream that this loaf of bread comes tumbling down the hillside and it destroys all of the camp. Maybe it looks something like this. And, I, and I, uh, We're in Missouri, and I love Lamberts. Anybody lo else love Lamberts? By this point in the message, we got about 10 or 12 minutes left in the message. Who's hungry? Anybody want some bread? I, could, I, I used to play baseball. All right. All right, Rick, here we go. Let me see if I can do it. Oh, a little long. A little long. All right, don't eat that. It hit the ground. All right, Rick, one more time. There we go. Yo! There we go. Anybody else? Anybody else hungry? Anybody else hungry? All right, we're going out in the back. Yeah, got him, got him. All right, anybody else, anybody else, anybody else? Right here in the front, right here in the front, right here in the front. Yeah. Oh, right on the money. All right. John in the back on the sound booth. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody. Barley bread, barley bread. It wasn't a food that people usually ate. In fact, it was eaten, in those days, it was eaten only as a last resort. If you had, there are better options for bread, wheat, rye, all sorts of different kind of grain that you could make bread out of. Barley bread was the leftovers. It, it was only eaten in seasons of famine or poverty, uh, or if you had no other options, then people would resort to it. And here's the point. Nobody wanted this. Nobody thought this had any value. Nobody thought barley bread was as good as any of the other options. It was thrown aside. It was, it was the last choice. It was the leftovers. And maybe that describes how you feel about yourself. When it comes to your life, when it comes to what you need to do with what's standing in front of you, maybe you don't feel like you can do it. Maybe you don't feel like you're enough. You're not as good as others. Maybe you feel insecure, critical of yourself. Maybe you've spent your entire life thinking or being told that you're not good enough and you don't have what it takes. 
The fact is that this kind of bread would have been common, would have been very ordinary. A barley cake would have been made on the hearth of a fireplace, uh, no larger than the size of a small biscuit. It wasn't intimidating. It wasn't big. So don't misunderstand the dream as if this like boulder-sized bread came rolling down the camp. It was a small little biscuit tumbling down the hillside. In fact, in the original Hebrew that the story is recorded for us, it indicates that it would have been a hard, thin biscuit. Something flat that came rolling and bouncing down the hill. There's nothing to fear about an ordinary, not good enough, flat biscuit until God uses it as an instrument in his hands. The Midianites were, in a sense, by telling this dream, were, in a sense, mocking Gideon and mocking the army of Israel, calling them nothing more than biscuits, Nothing more than bread. Nothing to fear here. And if that wasn't bad enough, not only did people just not eat this kind of bread until a last resort, but they usually made this bread to feed to their dogs. This, friends, is a glorified dog biscuit from the 12th century B.C. And they're calling Gideon and the army of Gideon dog biscuits. Nothing. No one. Table scraps, leftovers, not enough. What could they do? They don't have what it takes. And that's how a lot of us feel about ourselves. Can we really do anything about what's in front of us right now? Do I have what it takes? Can I make a difference? And if we're honest, most of us feel insecure and not up to the task and like we don't have what it takes. I know I feel that way a lot. Gideon felt that way in and out of the story multiple times. And here we learn that even his own enemies thought that way about him. Nothing. He's no one. Nothing to fear here until something happens and someone throws this with such force that something supernatural takes place. Maybe, maybe you feel in your life right now that you could never make a dent or make a change. Or what's in front of you is just impossible to do anything about. I want you to understand that there's a very real spiritual enemy that we all have who wants us to feel that way about ourselves. And I know maybe you're here and maybe you don't know what you believe. Maybe you have a really difficult time thinking that there's this person called the devil, this adversary, this spiritual enemy who's out to get us. It sounds really mythical. It sounds really legendary and childish to believe in that. And I respect you and I respect what you believe, but I want you to understand that the scriptures inform for us and even Jesus himself confirms for us the existence of a very real enemy to our spiritual life with God who fights against us and who fights against God and who would love for nothing more than for us to believe things about ourselves that just aren't true to lie to us about what we can do with God and what God can do with us. And he uses fear and insecurity and doubts as his tools of choice. Because if we can doubt God and what God can do with us and in us, we'll doubt ourselves. And our spiritual enemy will will work hard to keep our opinion of God and our opinion of ourselves really, really low so we don't trust him, so we don't hope in him for help that we need today. But what matters most isn't what you think of you, it's what God thinks of you. It's what God says about you, what God can do through you. God's answers are better than yours, and God's potential is bigger than yours. And on your own, while we might be helpless and hopeless, nothing more than this little flat biscuit, with God's hands, we can become something more and do something greater than what we could ever do on our own. And maybe things today in your relationships really stink. Maybe your marriage is at a breaking point, and you don't know. You wonder, can we even make it through this? Who am I? Can we save what, what we started so many years ago? Maybe you worry about your kids and whether you're being the parent that you need to be. They they want you and need you to be. You want to be a better influence. You want to help them in a better way, but you don't know if you can do it because you didn't have a great example. You're scared. You're failing. You don't have what it takes. Maybe you're struggling with that habit or that addiction that is secretly controlling your life and you want freedom from it, but you don't know what to do and you wonder, can I even ever make a change that would make my life better? Is what's in front of me too big for me to do anything about? Maybe you're just bound up with so much fear and worry. Maybe you were going to go to work tomorrow, and you just don't have any confidence that God can make, use you to make a difference there. Our spiritual enemy loves to use lies and fear and insecurity and hopelessness and helplessness so we doubt ourselves and we doubt what God can do through us. That's where Gideon was for most of this story. He doubted himself. He questioned God. Even after an angel appeared, even after God showed up after two crazy moments with this fleece thing, God, 
Gideon still struggled to believe in himself and in God. And then when his army goes away, and he's got 300 guys, and he hears tens of thousands of soldiers, he still struggles to believe. But now, in this moment, as he overhears the dream, and out of his own enemy's mouth about how God had already assured and given them victory, something inside of Gideon believes that God can use even dog biscuits like him. What can a simple, ordinary dog biscuit do? Nothing on its own. Nothing on its own. But when it's thrown from the hands of Almighty God, it can do impossible, unbelievable things. It can do powerful things that it never imagined it could ever do when God is the one helping us. No marriage, come on, is beyond saving. No child is beyond reaching. No addiction is beyond freedom. No problem is beyond a solution. No struggle you have is beyond hope. No life is beyond God's ability to help change when dog biscuits like me and dog biscuits like you trust God to do the impossible through us. Because you and I have a real spiritual enemy who wants us to doubt him and doubt ourselves and live in fear and live in bondage, controlled and oppressed, hopeless and helpless. But here's what I know about you. Even if I don't know you very well, I know that you Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, I know that you want things in your life to get better. Whatever it is that's in front of you that you need to get through, what life is throwing at you, you want it to change for the better. You want things to improve. You don't want your life to stay this way. We've all got this sense of there's got to be more to me, more to life, more to marriage, more to me and my kids, more to me and my career, more to me and God than this. There's got to be a way forward through what's in front of me but I don't know how to get there. Somewhere where there's more freedom and peace and power. The only way to get there is when we let God be the help that we need to get through whatever's in front of us right now. And, and after hearing his enemies talk about how God had given him victory, Gideon goes from a simple, ordinary dog biscuit to a victorious, mighty warrior, just as the angel said he would. Because God can help anyone, anywhere, anytime they're willing to trust and hope in him. Let me say that again. No matter who you are, anyone, anywhere, at any time who is willing to trust in the Lord and put their hope in Him, no matter what's in front of you, God will help you. He will help you. It's a promise. Throughout the scriptures, there's story after story of people who don't have what it takes, and God still uses them to do incredible, impossible things. And they're not always the smartest or the brightest or the most influential, but they're willing to trust God. They're willing to hope in Him. And because of that, God uses them. Gideon trusted God, and he goes back to his 300 men, and he follows everything God told him to do about what to do, faithful to that plan, They ambush the enemy that very night and they circle, those 300 men circle around the camp and they blew horns and they threw and clashed and crashed clay pots and when the enemy soldiers who were all asleep woke up to the sounds, they were so frantic and so disoriented that they ended up slaughtering themselves and killing one another while Gideon and all of his 300 men stood around the perimeter of the camp and didn't have to do a thing. God did it. God did it all. He just wanted Gideon to trust him and to hope in him, and God would do the rest. In a matter of moments, literally, the battle was over, and and Gideon stood there victorious. God has always helped and used people who don't think they have what it takes when they're willing to trust and hope in him. And God is calling you today and me today, just like he did Gideon so many years ago, to trust him with where we are and what we're walking through right now, with how we feel and with what we're up against, to trust him and to hope in him because he has the help you and I need to get through whatever is in front of you. He has a plan. He can be trusted. He loves you and wants to walk with you through it, not just to give you victory on the other side, but to help you as you go through it, become the person you were created to become. God still uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things in ordinary moments. And he wants that to be your story, and he wants that to be my story. Jesus used 12 dog biscuits to change the world. What can he do through you and me? Because here's what I know about God. He's no respecter of persons. He treats everybody the same. So if he can use them, friends, he can use us. But what does he want to do? 
If he can use them, he can use me, he can use you, and he can use you right where you are with what you're up against and with what you're walking through right now because that is the battle you're in. So, two thoughts before I pray. God wants you to know he, he's here to help you with what you're going through. And sometimes you feel like your circumstances are unique, too hard for God to help. Maybe they're too small and trivial for God to get involved in. How, why, why would God care about little old me going through this? I want you to know something. God does. He loves you and he cares about you and he wants to help you. He has a plan to walk with you through that. He wants to help our lives get better. And he wants to help us get better at life. And nothing anyone else says and nothing anyone says about themselves could ever disqualify us. Nothing we could have ever done could disqualify us from being someone God can help. And even if you're here and you doubt God, you, you don't even know what you believe and you wonder if he's even real, I want you to know God still loves you and wants to help your life. If you're willing to hope and trust in him, take a step of trust in his direction and watch how he comes through for you. It's important you know that God is with you, even if you don't believe in him. He's not against you. He loves you, and he wants to help your life. All you single moms out there, God's going to help you get through what you're going through. Husbands, wives, what you're walking through right now, God wants to help you get through what you're walking through. Parents, you wonder if you're making a difference. You wonder if you're doing it the right way. God wants to help you with what you're walking through. Just because what's happening and what stands in front of you seems big and hard and impossible on your own doesn't mean it's impossible for him. Because God can help you when you put your hope and your trust in him. And that's more than just saying, I know you're there. That's, that's you and me saying, in the moment that we need it, I don't know what to do, and I need you to do it for me. I need you to give me wisdom and help. I, I can't get through this under my own power. I can't get through this under my own wisdom. I can't get through this under my own strength. When I try to do that, it never turns out well in my life. That's when I always have regret. That's when I always take a detour from what God wants. But whenever I step and I trust in God, no matter if what he's asking me to do seems impossible, and I'm anchored in the, in the confidence and in the hope that he brings to my life, then no matter what, no matter how hard I know, I know that he will do exactly what he says he's going to do. He's proven it to me over and over and over again. Nothing is impossible to those who believe. Like the prophet Isaiah in the Jewish Old Testament scripture says, nothing is impossible because God can give strength to the most tired, weary person. He can increase our strength if we don't feel like we have anything in the tank because he's the source, not us. God loves to help those who hope in him and trust in him. And, this, and he's ready to help. For Gideon that day, he was the strength. For you today, he can still be the strength. If you trust in him, there can be hope. Let's stand together. We're going to pray in just a second. I'm going to ask you one simple question. What needs to get better. What makes you feel like this flat, crusty dog biscuit that you have no potential, power, wisdom, or strength to do anything about? What is it in your life, and even if you're here watching online and you don't know what you believe about God, what is it in your life that if you could wave the wand and change for the better, what would it be? That is what God wants to help you with today. So Lord, help us. All of us who know we don't have what it takes on our own, maybe we're willing today to acknowledge that you can do what we can't. Maybe we are a follower of you, and maybe we've just forgotten that, you know, you're the strength of our, so the source of our hope in our life. You're the strength, God, that we can't give ourselves, and maybe we've been trying to live our lives and follow you and, and do good and be good, but God, we're just running so thin because, God, we're not really relying on you as much as we are ourselves. I just pray that we would be inspired and reminded today that it's not by strength, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God who lives within us that can do what we could never do to be the husband and wife, the parent, the friend, the person, whoever, whatever we're facing, God, you're the one who will get us through what's in front of us right now. Remind us that it's not about us, it's about you. We owe everything to you and we need your help. God, you will help us if our hope is in you. And if we're here and we're not sure what we believe, maybe today we realize that on our own we 
Our lives have just gotten more and more complex and more and more messy, but today we hear about this God who loves me and who wants to help my life. Maybe today you're ready to believe. I would invite you to trust in him that he's more than a story. He's more than a man. He is the only one capable to help you, give you what you need to move forward in your life. He can forgive you from everything you've ever done and set you free from everything that holds you back so you could become the person, the more God created you for. I invite you to put your faith in Jesus, to trust in him as the son of God, as your savior, as your friend, who sticks closer than a brother. He will never leave you and he will never forsake you. He will never abandon anyone who trusts in him. And so Lord, we ask you to walk with us and let our hope be in you and let our trust be in you. And as we do, I pray, move mountains in our lives because that's what you do with little dog biscuits like us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're all dog biscuits. Have a great week. Be back here next Sunday for Hope Church.